it is officially time to talk about my favorite physics topic in the whole universe. And no, it's not because it's really advanced, no, it's not because it's used in some cool like device or something. It's because it doesn't require algebra to use. It requires calculus. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But seriously, like, Gauss's law is one of the coolest laws in the universe because it simplifies calculations so much. Like, sure, you gotta do a little calculus. It's okay. You can handle a little calculus. But it makes things so much easier, it's not even funny. Hello everybody, I'm Karar, and today we're going to be talking about Gauss's Law, which is a super, super cool law in physics that allows you to find the electric field literally anywhere around an object. Now this is both used a ton in ABC, ENF, and UFO, so if you're interested in either of those, you guys gotta listen real good. I might have scared you guys off with the calculus part, but for the most part, you literally don't even have to use that much calculus. It's not even funny. Honestly, like, the amount of calculus you have to use is close to zero, especially if you're just deriving simple things. So before we talk about Gauss's Law, let's first talk about what the heck an electric field is, right? And this will be like a two second explanation. So basically you have your Q plus charge here, and basically the electric field is the force on a test charge, Q, divided by the charge of that test charge, right? So because we know that these two are both positive charges, they exert a repulsive force on each other. So the force is gonna be this way and the electric field is gonna have a magnitude in the same direction of the force over the test charge Q. You probably know this already, but that is just equal to KQ over R squared, where R is the distance between the two charges. So essentially we could say that the electric field at this point is a vector pointing this way with magnitude of this. So I just like to think of electric field as a force field that a uh, point charge exerts, right? So this guy right here is pu pushing things out, right? It's pushing positive charges out, so its electric field is going outward. So this guy's electric field kind of looks like this. You got like electric field lines going out all these ways because that's the direction it pushes things in. So before we could understand Gauss's law, it's good to understand that how this uh, formula here relates to these lines over here, right? So clearly, as you get farther away, right, you're de decreasing the amount of force you could exert on other particles. It's like gravity, right? You exert less force as you're farther away. But why the heck is that? Well, if you can look at the lines, it makes so much more sense because let's say you're right around here, the lines are so dense right here. They're like literally right next to each other. So because these lines are so close together, they exert a lot more of an electric field. Now, if we go this far away from the point charge, there's the same amount of lines, right? but there's so much more spread out. So that's why the electric field is a lot weaker here. And the reason why it's a R squared is because like your amount of lines is the same, right? And your amount of lines is basically your Q. However, the area through which the lines pass increases a lot. So the actual amount of lines per area decreases. And you know that the surface area of a sphere is just four pi R squared. So you can see from here that you got your inversely proportional to R squared. But this works so well, right? We calculated the electric field. We, need, we just needed this one formula. Why the heck would we need like a Gauss's law? What the heck? Why should I learn something new? Well, if you ever try to find the electric field of a plane with this formula, you must know that it's very necessary that we have Gauss's law. Bruh, using this to calculate the electric field of a plane is disgusting. Let me show you. So let's say we have like a massive, infinitely large plane like this, and we want to find the electric field at a point here, right? Well, you might be tempted to just take a random point on the plane, right? and say this has an area A, and then the charge at that area is like the charge density times A, and then just apply this formula. If this distance is D, then the formula should just be KQ over D squared. But no, because all these other charges over here, they pull on this thing, they push on this nonsense. You can't, you gotta consider all that nonsense. So technically, if you wanted to find the electric field here, you'd have to integrate over the entire length of this plane and each of these points over here exerts a force in a different direction so you had to account for that and then you also had to integrate this way too so it's a two-dimensional integration and you also have to account for what direction it makes with it so it's kind of nasty but my friend gauss he decided to make this so much heck and easier for us so basically the idea behind gauss's law is the same thing that we were looking at earlier right if we have a q charge over here and we have this electric field going out here then over here we have much more dense lines and over here, we have much less dense lines, and that's why the electric field is less. So even though the number of lines is the same, the area through which the lines are spread over is increasing. So basically what Gauss said is that for a closed volume, which is like a sphere, right? It has no gaps in it. The electric flux is going to be proportional to the amount of charge inside the thing. And that makes sense, right? Because the electric flux is literally just the number of lines going through this area, right? And we know that if we increase the charge, we have to put more lines. So if we increase the charge, it's going to have more lines going through the area. So if we want to write this out properly. It's basically Q over epsilon naught, which is like your proportionality factor. It's called like permittivity of free space, but that's not that relevant. 
And this is equal to the magnetic flux, which is represented by this. Basically, this right here says that you're integrating over a closed surface, this circle right here, and then the other side is basically your formula for electric flux. Now, the reason why there's a dot product right there is if you have like a plane and you have a uh, electric field pointing this way, basically what the dot's saying is that you take the perpendicular component of the electric field and then you multiply it by the area. So essentially what this is saying is that your flux is constant. So your electric field dot product with the area is constant. However, that means that your like your electric field is inversely proportional to your area. And now this makes our original formula kq over r squared so much more sensical, right? Because it's basically saying that q over epsilon naught is equal to our magnetic flux. And we know that our magnetic flux is equal to the perpendicular component of the electric field times the area. And we know that the electric field is perpendicular at all these points because it's a sphere. So essentially, it's equal to E times A. And we know what the A for a sphere is. It's basically 4 pi r squared. And to array, we get our inverse square law. Oh my god, that is some crazy stuff. And this right here is just your K because it's a constant. So it's the same thing as K. Epic, we derived our electric field for a point source. So why don't we make this a bit more complicated? Why don't we try a, a plane now? So basically, you have your plane and you want to find the electric field at a point right here. Well, basically, I take two steps to solving Gauss's law problem. So why don't we draw this in 2D first, because that's easier to pay attention to. So it's like that. And then basically what I like to do is I like to draw lines where the electric field is equal, right? So we know that like if this is infinitely long, then this point is literally exactly the same as a point right here. Because like this point gets pulled on by this point, getting pulled this way, this way, this way, all the way to infinity, right? But then the other guy is exactly the same, right? He's just getting pulled in all these directions from all across the plane. So these two guys are exactly the same. And then as we go across, these guys are all the same as well. And then on the bottom, it's exactly the same thing. However, this is not a closed surface, right? We're just going infinitely long. It never closes off. So how do we close it off so that we can still calculate the answer? That is the second step. Find a way to close off your volume. So in this case, it turns out that if we literally just like drop it down here, you know that the electric field has to be perpendicular for it to count to the flux, right? Well, we know that the electric field has to be vertical, right? Because for any point, like you got an equal number of things pulling to the left and you got an equal number of things pulling to the right. So at any point, your, your electric field has to be vertical, so it can't be perpendicular to this side that we drew right here. And then same over here, if we draw over here, we get a closed thing over here. All right, we got our closed thing, so now we can apply Gauss's law. So at this point, it's good to turn it back to 3D, so why don't we make this boy 3D? Okay, so pretend that this part over here is our infinite plane, and then this right here is our closed surface, right? So we know that every point on this side has the same electric field, so that's good. And then we know that there's no electric flux getting contributed from this side because none of the electric field is perpendicular here. So essentially, the only thing that contributes is like this constant electric field, let's say E, times this area, which is perpendicular to, so that's just E times A. But then we also got the bottom side, so that's 2EA. And then this is just equal to the enclosed charge over epsilon. So what is the enclosed charge right here? It's literally just A times the charge density of the plane. And then this is equal to sigma a, and then over epsilon over here. And then basically, we could just get that e is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon. Very cool. Why don't we get even more complicated? Cylinder time. Okay, so we basically got our cylinder, and now we had to apply the same steps. So we first want to make it 2D and then find the points that are equal to each other. So honestly, we could go side view or top view. Why don't we try side view? Side view might work. So a side view from a cylinder is literally just a rectangle. And we could basically say that this like line over here all these points are equal right because they're all symmetric relative to the center of the cylinder and same with over here and let's pretend that the cylinder is infinitely long so we don't have to worry about like the edges right because like if it was not infinitely long then this point over here would be different from this point over here because this guy has pulls on both sides but this guy only has pulls on one direction so we make this 3d again it literally just looks like two nested cylinders okay so let's say that the charge density of the cylinder is rho right then what is the enclosed charge of the cylinder? That's right, you got, got to multiply by the area of this cylinder. So let's say this is R, right? Then the area, or not area, volume of the cylinder is going to be pi R squared times H. So this whole thing is H and then over epsilon zero. Then what about the right side of the equation? Well, basically if this is infinitely long, all of your things are going to be pulling inward, right? Because they're going to have equal things pulling upward and equal things pulling downward. So your electric field has to be this way. So for the top and the bottom faces, they're not going to contribute at all to this because there's not, nothing perpendicular to it. So the only thing that contributes is this big rectangular side. And we can find the area of that is just 2 pi r l. 
or 2 pi r h. And we know that the electric field is the same everywhere because it's radially symmetric. Oh my god, using my bio terminology, very cool. So essentially, E times this thing over here is equal to rho pi r squared h over epsilon naught. And then if we just solve for this, we literally get that E is equal to rho r over epsilon. That's not a rho, what the heck? Over 2 epsilon, but this got to change from beta to a rho. Epic. So that was not even too bad. We haven't used any calculus yet, and we've already gotten the electric field for a cylinder. Okay, we are gonna get more complicated two more times, and then we are done. Let us try a conducting sphere. So let's say we have a conducting sphere, right? Wait, why don't we be even more fancy and say that you got a conducting sphere with a charge inside, and the conducting sphere is like neutral, but this is a charge Q. Basically what I'm trying to do in this example is draw attention to the fact that you have to only include the enclosed charge. So essentially, like if you're finding the like electric field inside, you know that the electric field only has to worry about this charge over here. And for that reason, we already know that it's just KQ over R squared. However, within the conducting sphere, the electric field has to be zero by definition of a conductor. Because conductors, basically what they do is they make the electric field inside of them zero. And the reason why that is, is because they basically separate the charges. So there's a bunch of minus charges here, and then there's a bunch of plus charges on the outer surface. So if we like add up the enclosed charge, like from the middle, you got the, all these minuses and then this positive in here and they cancel out exactly. So in your gases law, it's literally gonna be zero over epsilon naught is equal to EA. So your E is just gonna be equal to zero. So once you're outside, you know that your conducting sphere is neutral, right? So that means that the only charge that contributes is the inner charge. So you go back again to the same equation. So inside is KQ over R squared. Within the conductor is zero. And then once you go outside of it, it goes back to this again. Okay, epic. Now, for the last example, we are going to use calculus finally. It's going to be epic. So let's say you have a sphere, and its charge density at any point is rho of r. So it's not a constant density anymore. So essentially, you should not have to worry about the density at all when you're setting up your Gauss's law, right? So your Gauss's law is literally just the enclosed q, q enclosed, over epsilon naught is equal to your e, which should be constant if we use a spherical thing, times the area, which we know is 4 pi r squared. If this radius here is r. Okay, so literally, if we just look at this equation, we know we have everything we need except q enclosed. So we can just forget about the Gauss's law thing and just solve for q enclosed, and then after that, we can plug it in and we're Gucci. Sometimes people get confused and they like plug in the integration for q enclosed in here, and then they try to like move this over there and try to integrate. Don't do that. Like this equation right here is completely separate from Q and close. The only thing we want to use calculus for is to find Q and close. So let's do that. So the way I like to think about calculus problems is you want to split it up into like chunks, right? So the best way to split up a sphere is into like concentric shell. So this shell right here, like let's say it's like this, right? It got a thickness of like dr, let's say, uh, dA, let's say. And then the volume of this shell is going to be 4 pi a squared dA. So then what is the charge of this shell? That is right, it is just this times rho a. Okay, so we wanted the total enclosed charge, we gotta integrate this whole thing from zero to r because we wanna add up all the shells within this r. So to continue with the problem, we now have to know what rho of r is, so we'll just say r and then let's try this. So integral of zero to r of four pi a squared dA times a, so that will be a cubed here. So this right here is equal to a to the fourth times pi, which is just pi r to the fourth. And then literally, we just plug this in and we are done. So we plug that in, we divide over here, and we get that E is equal to R squared over four epsilon zero. All right, very epic. We have finally explained how Gauss's law worked. Just whenever you're doing calculus version of Gauss's law, try to make sure you keep the two things separate. You first set up your Gauss's law equation, and then you find what Q and close. And basically that's my strategy for Gauss's law problems. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Thank you guys for watching again, and see you guys next time.